I'm State Senator Judy Schwank, and um, you are in the 11th District right now, and I have the honor of being here today um, with a friend and colleague, Senator Arthur Haywood. Senator Haywood and I have worked on many initiatives. Um, however, um, I have to say that in, in terms of his work on equity and inclusion has, and diversity has been exceptional and outstanding in our Senate Democratic Caucus. I've much admired the things that he has done. He, um, he has looked at all of our state system universities in terms of ensuring that if you know, we are, we're making, we're making sure that we are offering the services and the kind of programming that all students can participate in. So I give great credit to um, Senator Haywood. As a friend, I can say that he is persistent, if nothing else. He truly um, has stayed on the issues and made sure that um, we can include everyone. And so I look forward to the conversation today as Senator Haywood talks about the study that he has done, the first ever, as far as I know, in terms of the Pennsylvania State Senate. So I give you my friend and colleague, Senator Arthur Haywood. Art. So first of all, I really want to thank Senator Swank for helping to organize this event in her town. She has been a tremendous champion for equity and inclusion at the state system. You may or may not know that she's on the board and at every board meeting where there's an opportunity to speak for making sure that there's equitable and fair treatment for students, uh, she is that spokesperson. Uh, we've combined for a number of initiatives in, in across the Commonwealth and I'm glad that this is one of them. Uh, not long ago, actually February 28th, we released our first State of Black Pennsylvania report. This is a report that was primarily done by the Senate Democratic Caucus researchers. And what I asked them to do was to look at the position of African Americans from 2010 to 2021, that decade. Not look at the black-white comparison that so often but looking at the progress of over time of black households in Pennsylvania. This was especially important because we got to address the long successful history of African Americans overcoming adversity, overcoming enslavement, overcoming segregation, overcoming systemic discrimination. And there has been progress along those lines. Now, there were a number of what my wife called surprisingly positive features of this report. Surprising because often the story of black people in America is not of overcoming. It is of not of accomplishments, only individual accomplishments. So here are a few highlights that I'd like to share before I turn it over to some outstanding, exceptional individuals who are going to speak and who are joining me as we have a broader roundtable discussion this afternoon, right here and ready at this most famous church. Thank you, Pastor Allen. A few highlights. The one that my wife first mentioned was the number of African American households earning over $100,000. Look at 2010 compared to 2021, there's a dramatic increase in these high earning black households often not reported until this report, I believe largely unknown. A second feature that we found in our report was the dramatic decline in African Americans in the state incarceration system. A 32% decrease between 2010 and 2021, 8,000 people. We're all concerned about mass incarceration but there's been a sharp decline in the state's incarceration in Pennsylvania that should be recognized. And the last thing I'd like to uh, highlight, at least before we get into the round table and be, before I turn it over to our state representative, is that we have had a significant decline in poverty. Now, it wasn't dramatic, like 50%, but it was a 3 or 4% decline over the decade. And what that means is that as we decrease poverty over time, then many of the conditions that we know are connected with poverty will also decrease. 
So those are a few of the highlights I'd like to share. There's more in the report. It's available online. But I'm not going to turn it over to our state rep. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Uh, Joanna, how do you pronounce your last name? Cepeda Freitas. Cepeda Freitas. Oh, Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so my name is Johanny Cepeda Freitas, representing the 129th Legislative District, which is right here as well. Um, thank you to our amazing leaders for putting this together. A special thank you and congratulations to Senator Art Haywood for compiling this data, which is of extreme importance, it's invaluable, right? So it gives us uh, more tools and more information so as legislators, we know what we need to start working on or continue to work on, so thank you for that. Um, a couple of excerpts that also uh, were, were, of, uh, were highlighted or that I was kind of like zooming in on was one that Senator Haywood mentioned which say, states more black workers are earning wages above poverty level than in previous years with 51,225 households elevating out of poverty. Despite this progress, the poverty rate among the state's black community remains at nearly 25% of black individuals in 2021. So obviously, as a legislator, I feel the urge and the need to, to continue to combat the poverty, right? Uh, my goal, along with my colleagues, is to obviously bring resources and funding to our underrepresented communities. Um, there's another uh, area, too, that kind of like stood out to me, which is the educational component. Mm -hmm. You know, it states the number of black students enrolled in school declined across the Commonwealth from a total of 436,600, excuse me, 436,990 students in 2010 to 353,490 in 2021, according to the U.S. Census Bureau data. Despite a shrinking number of black or African American students in schools rosters, Black Pennsylvanians were more likely to have attained some college education in 2021. So obviously as a legislator and as we head into budget negotiations, I'm personally committed to ensure that our public schools are supported and properly funded. Thank you once again. I'm looking forward to the discussion because obviously as a collective, as a community, we, we share in, in the responsibility of making it I'm, I'm working on legislation that, that really impacts and make a difference and continues to make a difference in our community. So thank you so much. And at this time, I have the honor of passing it on to Sandra Thompson, president of the NAACP. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. Thank you again, Senator Haywood. <laughs> you, you moved on me. And Pastor as well for hosting. I am Sandra Thompson. I'm an attorney. I'm also president of the NAACP Pennsylvania State Conference. Uh, we are community advocates working to open doors of opportunity to diverse and typically underrepresented communities in education equity, financial equity, voter rights, housing, and other areas of community and constitutional concerns that include ending mass incarceration. So we are so happy to see that this report was done and seeing also the results of the uh, report that there has been a slight drop in the black population of Pennsylvania prisons but they still make up 46 percent of the prisons so we still have work to do so there are the things that we want to do from today for the next 10 years and beyond we must continue to educate our people are often kept in survival mode. So we must lay out why these issues are important to them. And we must keep advocating even when it seems to agitate our allies who think that they are doing enough. And we must keep advocating even when it aggravates those who would keep us bound. So we will continue to seek legislation and policies that we will decriminalize marijuana and addiction and mental health issues. We will keep supporting legislation to reconcile the Medical Marijuana Act with the DUI laws. And we will work to improve society ills by providing or asking that legislatures provide a livable wage, quality education in the low wealth communities to improve high school completion rates and literacy skills and employability. 
we will further advocate for responsible firearm legislation and to educate on responsible firearm possession to reduce violence in our communities so that there will also reduce the need for incarceration. Thank you very much. And now, I have the pleasure of introducing and bringing to uh, Daisha Dixon, VP of DEI and Community Wellness, Tower Health. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, good afternoon. My name is Deisha Dixon. Um, I'm Vice President for DEI and Community Wellness at Tower Health. Uh, many thanks to uh, Senator Haywood for inviting me to speak to you today and join you. Um, as I read the report, I thought it was excellent. So well done. Well done to you and your team and to everyone that contributed to the report. Uh, so as I was reading it, a few things stood out. Um, when we do reports like this, when we have research like this, um, that is often the first step. So the next step is what are we going to do? What is the action plan? What is our, um, what is our uh, journey forward to, to, one, ensure that the momentum and the gains that we've seen we continue to see, and in areas where we see opportunities, how do we, how do we move forward with that? So I want to encourage everyone that's here and is listening is when it's time for action planning, come to the table. And when you are encouraged to participate and share your unique experiences and participate and your and your uh, perceptions and your experiences, offer that. Um, don't pass up on the opportunity to have your voices heard. As a community, as a people, our experiences are so unique and so valuable, and our perspectives are needed as we try to find solutions. So don't turn down the opportunity to have your voices heard. The second point that stood out to me is so although we saw many, many gains across um, different sectors with black um, Pennsylvanians in this report, the one thing that we did see was an increase in diabetes amongst African Americans. Um, and we know that the black community is disproportionately affected by diabetes. Uh, we know that the National Institutes of Health notes that uh, genetic, environmental, socioeconomic, um, physiological, and behavioral factors all contribute to this health disparity. Um, but we also have an opportunity to look at this health disparity and, and think about what can we do, what do we have control over within our own community. And there are some things that, that we can do. Uh, number one, we can get screened for diabetes. And we can um, encourage our family and friends and our neighbors to get screened as well. Uh, we can break up with unhappy, unhealthy habits. So um, less fried foods, more baked and boiled meats, less sugary foods. We can get moving, and again, as a community, um, we have done amazing things. I think you mentioned, Senator Haywood, we are used to overcoming adversity, so we can do this. We, sh we, don't, we don't have to be um, beholden to this disparity. So get moving. Form a walking club with your friends, with your neighbors, with your coworkers, and then support. Uh, we know as a community that the, uh, the, the, the power of a strong support system is really immovable. And so I, I encourage everyone, if you know someone who is diabetic, give them a call, mm -hmm. encourage them to eat healthier, help them walk the walk with them. Um, again, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today, and I'm really encouraged by what I read in this report, and I look forward to your next report in 10 years. So, thank you very much. And coming next is Bradera. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Rodara McClendon. I'm also the founder and executive director of the Village of Reading. Uh, our mission is to eradicate youth violence. Um, I am covering today um, the study that was done on education, and I find it quite alarming, uh, the significant uh, decrease of students not enrolled in school. Uh, the number is 952,204 young black or African American people that are not enrolled in school. And that, that struck me, but I also find that very personal to me because I too uh, dropped out of the ninth grade. And I said this in a prior uh, study that was done in writing on education. Um, and we know that the number one cause of death for young uh, black men is gun violence. Mm -hmm. Um, and I stated this, that until we tap into those young people's home lives and really address trauma, we can expect to see this number uh, continue to uh, incline in the amount of dropouts. Uh, so I just, wanted, uh, I just want to urge everyone in this room today to really focus on trauma healing and social services like mental health services. Thank you. I'm now turning over to Salita Simmons. 
Thank you, first of all, for inviting me. I definitely appreciate it. Thank you, Radara. Uh, my name is Celia Simmons. I am the executive director of a nonprofit here based in Reading, PA, called The Real Deal 610. I am also the uh, FAST coordinator for Berks Community Action Program. And I myself, as well, am going to address um, the education um, aspect of things. Being as though we are actually in the school district and we work hands on, not only with the staff, but with the students. What I find very alarming is a lot of these numbers are not accurate for our city. Um, one of the things that we need to understand is we need to start holding people accountable for the decrease when it comes to our children and their education. What I find very alarming as well is that we don't have anybody from the education department here to speak on behalf of that. One of the things that's very alarming is in, in our school district, the food situation. Food. Uh, kind of fuels your brain to want to even do anything and we are dealing with situations where we are providing our children with rotten food. Also, we cannot trust our school system because a lot of the times information that is rendered to us as parents are inaccurate information. I am a mother of three. I have a child in Reading High School, I have a child in the middle school, and I have a child in elementary school. A lot of times people do not want to bring the problem to the surface and if we don't do that we will never come up with a solution. Once we start getting into these schools and educating our children on the lowest level, a lot of these things that we're facing today will be eradicated. Not all of them, but the majority of them because information is power. Mm -hmm. And if we don't continue to inform our students that they are the future and the power that they possess is essential to the outcome of our city, we are failing them from day one. Um, another thing I like to see is more diversity in our schools. There is no diversity, and I find it very unfair to put a teacher in a compromising position where they're trying to motivate our children but have no clue of their culture, their demographic background, none of the above. Um, so I would like to see more education with diversity in our school districts, and I also would like to see more of voices of young adults being heard because they are crying out. The very same kids that we are labeling as at youth at-risk youth are the very same kids that are crying out for help, and they're being denied that on all levels in our school district. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And the next person that will be coming after me is Pastor Alec. Well, basically, I stand before you to simply say I read the report. I was encouraged by a lot of what I read. Uh, but I also hope that as we move forward, more discussions like this will take place, but not just discussions. I'd like to know what's going to happen. It's wonderful to have statistics. It's wonderful to have information. Uh, but again, those of us on the ground floor uh, want to know, where do we go from here, chaos or community? Uh, or is it just something we do when an election comes up? We need to see our politicians more. Uh, if you want to come to the churches, come and worship with us. Uh, sit down. Don't just do a drive-by. Uh, but see who we are and see who the people are that you represent. Uh, we're very interested in being a part. Not coming with hands out looking for grants. We want to provide services too that we think can help eliminate or at least ameliorate some of these problems. Uh, for example, during COVID, uh, our church right here in partnership with our Reading and Vicinity Ministerial Association, as well as Chosen 300, was able to distribute food, food boxes. Uh, and the lines were all around the block as people came to get food. We were a church working with Senator uh, Judy Schwank's office that was able, again, to get vaccine testing here in our parking lot since they couldn't come in the building. And then we became a vaccine site. I'm not the only church that's doing that. There are many. There are many churches that are working and providing services that can help to address the various issues, the comorbidities uh, that are talked about in the report. I like to see the report. This is a good beginning. I'd like to see more, and I'd like to see some action. I'd like to know where do we go from here. Thank you. We're going to have our city council person. I met him briefly in the state senate as when he was an intern. But uh, please share some words, and then we'll give a <coughs> quick uh, wrap up, and then we're going to break out to our round table. Wesley, come on up, please. Thank you, Senator, for allowing me to speak. Uh, don't worry, as many people in here, I'm not a long-winded speaker at all. <laughs> um, so 
What I found uh, most interesting in the report is with earnings on the rise, an additional 40,286 black Pennsylvanians secured housing within the past decade from over 484,000 residents in 2010 to 524,637 in 2021. And the number of owner-occupied housing units declined from about 47% to 44% between 2010 and 2021, while renter-occupied units increased from about 52.8% to 55.3%. In terms of next steps, um, although more black people are finding housing, I would like to see the number of <coughs> owner-occupied housing units increase amongst the black community. Being able to have ownership and property and pass it down to our uh, children will create generational wealth in the black community. Uh, another point I wanted to touch on was uh, education. I know it was talked about. Uh, I really feel that STEM education is important. Um, yes, black people, um, and other jobs and owning businesses is great, but black people getting into STEM education will increase income as well. Um, now I'm one of those kids in high school that did not like uh, most of the STEM classes that I took. Uh, talking to former classmates, they said that STEM classes were the most difficult, but they were given the least amount of help from those who taught those STEM subjects. So I would say in our schools that uh, we need to do a better job of giving students help with those STEM classes because as we know, um, STEM classes in terms of careers is where uh, people make the most money at compared to others. And uh, the statistic for that is that uh, STEM occupations hold an annual mean wage of $100,900 compared with 55000 for non-STEM jobs, according to the USBLS. Um, education boosts income even further, and uh, STEM workers with a bachelor's degree earn roughly 30% more than those in similar positions without a degree. Uh, and I think we're making, we're making headway because our Reading School District here is planning on opening up a campus that's gonna serve about 700 to 1,000 students. And this will be a STEM school that focuses on science, technology, engineering, and mathematics educations. And, uh, Hopefully the programs will be focused on career pathways and provide options for high school students to thrive in smaller learning environments. So again, thank you, Senator, for allowing me to speak. And I can't wait to talk about solutions to education and income in this report. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, someone else mentioned to me I need to identify some elected officials who may be here that haven't been identified already. I've already done that, thanks so much. <laughs> so I'll be glad to take any questions from anyone from the media before we go to our round table, which we'll hopefully have a, a more significant discussions about where we go from, where we go from here. Um, this is the first study that I've seen in Pennsylvania that looks at the last 10 years. So I'm very glad we were able to make this contribution. And hopefully each decade or so we can see what progress we're making on critical issues that face our community. In this decade that we're in, the current decade, we can make more progress on income. We can make more progress on education, on home ownership, on some of these key issues as we look at what worked or didn't work in the last decade. I did want to mention one other thing with respect to education, and that's the higher education numbers in the report. African-American males in higher education grew by 73% 2010, 2021. 70, over 70% more African-American males in higher education 2010, 2021. That's significant. And for African-American females, it was over half. That is significant. Glad to take any questions before we shift over to the round questions for the round table for me, media folks. If not, we're going to end the media piece and have the discussion piece. I see no more from the media. Going once, going twice, so we're going to flip over to the discussion piece. Thanks so much. All right. Media had their shot. Hopefully, you shared something with them. Thank you so much. Before.